Welcome to Peninsula TV's coverage of the 2019 Progress Seminar. For 50 years, the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce has been holding this weekend retreat, bringing together community leaders from businesses and nonprofits and also our local government for keynote sessions and to meet up close and personal in breakout sessions discussing current community issues and problems of today. This year's topics included criminal justice reform in California. What are the impacts? Mobility funding, getting the wheels turning, the housing crisis, modern solutions and the political will behind them, regionalism, we are stronger together than apart. Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency Agency, a unified voice for resilient San Mateo County shoreline by 2100. And now on to Peninsula TV's coverage of the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce 2019 Progress Seminar. Congresswoman Jackie Speer is a San Mateo County and California superstar. She released her autobiography entitled Undaunted to coincide with the 40th anniversary of the Jonestown tragedy. Even though I've known and worked with Jackie for over 25 years, there were many surprises and never before revealed elements of her life story in the memoir, some delightful and some heartbreaking. In decades of public life, Jackie has served our, as a San Mateo County Supervisor, as you know, a State Assembly member, State Senator, and now our Congresswoman. As a member of the legislature, she was widely regarded as the Babe Ruth of the legislature as a result of not only the volume of laws written, but the genuine impact on 39 million Californians with an emphasis on consumers, women's and children's health, and governmental efficiency. As her biography notes, Jackie relishes slaying dragons, and we've all witnessed her fearless and undaunted approaches to challenging powerful forces, whether financial services giants on the issue of consumer financial privacy, or the current administration on a range of issues. Having persisted in being a member of the Democratic minority for a bulk of her service in the House, she is now front and center with a direct line to the Speaker of the House, with Democrats firmly in control of the House of Representatives. She has become Chairwoman of the Military Personnel Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee, where she is leading the charge on addressing sexual assault within the military ranks, as well as coming off victories on changing House procedure in combating sexual harassment on Capitol Hill. She was named to Newsweek's list of 150 fearless women in the world and one of Politico's 50 most influential people in American politics for bringing the Me Too reckoning to the halls of Congress. And just this week, it was announced that she has become co-chair of the House Democratic Women's Caucus. She is routinely... <laughs> she is routinely a guest on CNN, MSNBC, and was featured recently on Showtime's The Circus, discussing the House Intelligence Committee's investigation into the President's ties to Russia. And she was even a character played on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and while she's not currently one of the 30-some Democrats either rumored or actually running for President of the United States, I know who my write-in candidate's going to be for the early California primary. In a recent book tour, she was featured on the Today Show, Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil, and has now worked her way up to the Progress Seminar. We are delighted to welcome her for an intimate fireside chat without the fire, but she will undoubtedly still bring the heat. Our Congresswoman and Dragon Slayer, Jackie Spear. Kevin didn't say is that he was my district director many years ago, and I paid him to do that. <laughs> Jackie, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And uh, we'd like to kick it off with just asking you why you wrote the book, and tell us a little bit about that, and then anything else you'd like to add, of course. 
So I, I wrote the book because, first of all, it was the 40th anniversary of Guyana, and I thought it was a, a good time to recall that experience and give my perspective on it. But the, the biggest reason I wrote the book is for my kids. Um, I wanted them to have um, a record of uh, what had happened in my life, and, and more importantly, the lessons I learned in life so that when they have tough times, they can recall elements in the book that could help them. Uh, the funny part was that they asked me to voice the book, and I thought, I do not have time to voice this book. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I was going to do the, the prologue and the acknowledgments. And then they sent me five voices of women that were going to, one of whom would be hired to voice the book. And I listened to these voices and I thought, I can't do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I spent two and a half days mm. voicing the book for Audible. And it was such an interesting experience because you're in a, in a closet. Your director is remote. He was in Michigan. <laughs> There's this big, burly guy who is the sound guy and has that, all that equipment. And uh, for two and a half days, I would you know, say two or three lines, and he, the director would say, no, you've got to repeat this all day long for two and a half days. But it eventually got um, completed. And now uh, my kids again will have my voice when I'm long gone. So uh, that was one of the special uh, benefits of it all. You wanted to talk to, about, uh, talk to us about the prologue. So I, I want to just read the prologue to kind of set the stage. Um, Jackie, could you also share with the audience you have two children, just to, for those that oh, don't know. OK, so I have two children. <laughs> uh, Jackson Sierra, who is now 30 years old, and he is a software engineer at LinkedIn. He did not follow his mother's recommendation to become a doctor, um, <laughs> but he's having a good life. Uh, and uh, our daughter, Stephanie, who is a TV anchor and reporter in, uh, at the ABC affiliate in Colorado Springs. And I can't get her home fast enough. Um, she's been there for two and a half years. It is the most conservative spot on the planet. And uh, <laughs> to just kind of put it in perspective, she did this one story about um, the homeless. And there was a, 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 a segment where the, uh, one of her, uh, the people she was interviewing was homeless but working and working two jobs. And her news editor told her to take that out of the story. Yeah. Um, and his idea of being prepared um, each morning is to read the Drudge Report and the Daily Caller. So if you haven't read those, um, I highly recommend it once. Uh. <laughs> OK, anything else about my family that you'd like to know? Okay. <clears throat> One of the things that is in the book, I had um, a very difficult time um, conceiving. Uh, so after Jackson was born, um, I had two miscarriages um, and then a failed adoption. And then mirac miraculously got pregnant um, with Stephanie. And then, as many of you know, my first husband was killed in an automobile accident when I was pregnant with Stephanie. So um, all of that's in here as well. But let me just read you the prologue. I was dying. It was just a matter of time. Lying behind a wheel of the airplane, bleeding out of the right side of my devastated body, I waited for the rapid shooting to stop, and then said my act of contrition, praying by rote for forgiveness. I used what little energy I had left to finish the prayer before the lights went out. But the lights didn't go out, and I slowly began to take stock of my situation. I was 28 years old, and I was about to die. My life would never be the one I had imagined. I'd never get married or become the mother of a boy and girl, or leave the world a better place, or gently pass when it was my time to go, surrounded by loved ones. Instead, my story was coming to an end on a dusty runway in the humid Guyanese jungle, thousands of miles from home. 
I don't know if it's possible to articulate how urgently aware you become of the fleeting nature of your existence when you're confronted with its end. I lay there for what felt like an eternity. Somehow, through the encroaching darkness of my final thoughts, I saw my 87-year-old grandma, Emma, the tough, marvelous matriarch of my family. All I could think of was I'm not going to have her live through my funeral, not if I could help it. I couldn't bear the vision of her sitting in front of my casket, suffering. If not for my reverence for her, I don't believe I would be alive today. She encouraged me to summon my will to move. Breathing heavily, I dragged my shattered body away from the wheel. Neither my doctors nor I could explain how I physically managed it, given my state. But I pulled myself up to my feet and stumbled around to take shelter in the baggage compartment. I survived. Survival against unfathomable odds can make every day that follows swell with a renewed sense of purpose, though not immediately and not for everybody. But with a hindsight of 40 years, I see that my baptism by gunfire guided me into the life I was meant to live, one of public service, one that would ignite the courage to make my voice heard, and one that would carry with it a visceral appreciation for each new day. That sentiment was far from my desperate thoughts at the time. Truth be told, it would have been far easier to have closed the box on Guyana long ago, or to have pushed the memory away into the recesses of my mind. What happened in that jungle was a massacre, a nightmare. Though I survived, something within me did die on that airstrip, be it my innocence or my belief in the natural fairness of life. But I can't deny how radically that nightmare molded my perspective and my instincts and how much it has informed the woman I am today. We don't get to choose our formative moments. Very often, adversity and failure shape us more permanently than fortune and success. That has certainly been the case in my life. The major setbacks I've endured, and there have been many, have actually propelled me onward, each one reminding me how important it is to stand up again. As difficult as it may be, stronger and more steadfast. Pain yields action. It can introduce a fervor to speak out for those whose voices are not heard. Surviving Jonestown crystallized where I needed to focus my energy. It convinced me that I did have a purpose. All I had to do was figure out how to fulfill it. So when you hear something like that, and if there are books that everyone will be receiving, um, as I read this book, I saw someone knock down, knock down, knock down, and you kept getting up through Guyana, through the loss of two babies, through your husband, through an election loss, which I don't think you can compare in the other losses. Well, there were three, though. <laughs> <laughs> but you kept getting up. Can you help us, like, understand that? So I, I really wanted this book to be a message about resilience. We all have a reservoir of resilience inside of us. Um, oftentimes, it's not tapped. Uh, Gratefully for many, never tapped, but most all people have moments when um, they really feel like they can't get up again. And so I wanted this to be a book that spoke all those uh, experiences in life. And I talk about the three elements in my life that helped me get up every time. And it was uh, the three Fs I referred to them. Family, friends, and faith. Uh, they have, those are the three legs of the stool that have kept me upright. Uh, there's a story I tell in the book that I love telling in person because I can really say it with fer fervor. Um, after Steve had died, and I was pregnant with Stephanie, and it was a high-risk pregnancy um, because I had lost two um, fetuses, uh, two um, 
um, pregnancies before, um, and they had decided that I had an incompetent cervix. Leave it to physicians <laughs> <laughs> to identify um, uh, problems. But anyway, so they called it, I had an incompetent cervix. So uh, a week after Steve's um, funeral, I had to go into the hospital and have my cervix sewed up to try and hold on to the fetus. So I'm at bed rest um, for a, a period of weeks negotiating bills from my bed, I might add. A lemon law, I negotiate, Kevin, just for the record, <laughs> from, from my bed. Uh, and my uh, father and mother came over to visit. Uh, this is the family component of what keeps you um, upright. And I'm in bed and dad comes up and he says, how are you doing? And I was so down and so depressed um, and so fearful. And I said, Daddy, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can, I can go through with this. I don't know if I could bring this baby into the world without a father and how I can even go on. Now, my dad was German, very Germanic. He turns to me and says, Jackie, Steve's been dead for three months. Get over it. <laughs> Harsh. Harsh, yeah. That, Harsh. So. So I was, I was furious, and I said, Dad, get out of my room. <laughs> and I didn't talk to him for two weeks. But the message, very powerful. Um, we have to get over these personal traumas. I mean, I had to get over Guyana. I did not want to spend the rest of my life as a victim of Guyana. I didn't want that to be the label associated with my name. So. Um, there are you know, mechanisms to get over it. And there were times that I didn't want to get out of bed. And I would, I would basically allow myself not to get out of bed that day. And then I would just tell myself that the next day I had to get up. And then I would get up. And every time you do get up, you find out that you're much more functional and capable than you think you are. It's interesting that you talk about your dad, you talk about your family a lot in this book, but speaking about your father who was an immigrant and proud of it, because I've been at a couple of naturalization ceremonies with you, mm -hmm. um, how, well, how, how does that make you feel with today's uh, angst in Washington over immigrants? Oh, it, it you know, breaks my heart because there's not one of us. How many of us have an immigrant family member in our lives? There you have it. I mean, it is the story of America. The Statue of Liberty is there um, with the inscription that is on it for a reason. And to put this in perspective, we have historically allowed 100,000 refugees to come into the United States a year. Uh, President Trump reduced the number to 40,000, and then last year there were only 20,000 that were accepted into the United States. So when the president says, well, we have no room, um, talk to the uh, farmers in the Central Valley and ask them if we don't have room. Or um, the, the workers in slaughterhouses or the, the, the construction workers. I mean, we, um, we, our country is the shining light on that hill around the world because of what our values are. And we can't let that um, be lost. So my dad was an immigrant. He, um, it's a very colorful life story about him. Um, I have Armenian genocide on my mother's side of the family, and I have the Holocaust on my father's side of the family. My grandparents, my grandfather was taken by the Gestapo, and then my grandmother somehow got him out, and they spent the war years in Shanghai. Uh, and I, a former staff member was just in Shanghai, and they, I guess they put up some kind of a, um, a uh, recollection of that and have um, engraved all the names, and it was so amazing to see my grandparents' names there. Because, you know, you, you hear things as <clears throat> a child growing up, and you don't know how much of it's true and how much of it's folklore. This was actually true. Um, <clears throat> but my dad um, <clears throat> was so proud to be an American that when he died, his only request 
was that he be buried in a pine box with the American flag on it. That's what immigrants bring to this country. And as a, as a law student, I, all through high school and college, I used to have to type with carbon paper their tax return every year. It was <laughs> the most arduous process that I had to go through. I hated it. But when I was in law school, I'm taking tax law. So I'm thinking, oh, I can actually help them. So I said to my dad, you know, there's some tax deductions you can take here that you're not taking. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm so grateful to be an American. The federal government gets a few extra tax dollars from me. It's OK. Now, how many of us would say that? <laughs> <laughs> Starting from you know where. OK. Uh, <laughs> That's actually one of Brian Perkins, who has been with you for 39, almost 40 years. That's one of his favorite stories. And he had wanted to make sure you would talk about it. So it's, that's terrific. Going back, you grew up in the inner sunset, and then at two, your family moved to South San Francisco. And your mom, the way you describe her in the book, I was like, oh gosh, I would have, I mean, she was a tough, very tough mom. And she had you and your brother, Eric, sell some things in the neighborhood. <laughs> so could you talk about that? Yeah, long before I knew about precinct walking. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, she would make succulents in little containers, and she would send us out to go sell them to the neighbors. <laughs> Seriously. Then she would make, um, I don't know, gift uh, um, cards, and we would have to go out and sell them. And I never knew what happened to that money. But <laughs> <laughs> Was but, it on the tax return? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So um, they, they were you know, blue collar through and through and didn't have money. We, it was, you know, it was a typical blue collar family in South San Francisco. Um, to the extent that I wanted to be a Girl Scout and my parents said, no, we don't, you know, you can't be a Girl Scout, we can't afford the uniform. I wanted ballet lessons, didn't have ballet lessons. Now my father, on the other hand, made sure we had judo lessons. So at South San Francisco High, every Wednesday night, after we had um, a dinner of liver, fried liver, we went to judo. Uh, <laughs> so you can see there's kind of a colorful childhood. The, what I've learned about writing this book, and let me, let me suggest to each of you to write your family story, write your story. It is so fulfilling, personally, and you learn things about yourself that you would never have, um, I think, found out about yourself had you not written it. <clears throat> For me, I, um, you know, I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, I also felt that I was, you know, more sophisticated than my parents, um, and, you know, that I somehow knew more than my parents. And as I wrote the book, I realized, my goodness. Um, they're the first people I acknowledge in the book because I recognized after writing it that I was part of their fabric. I, and my values today are because of the values that they instilled in me. Um, so I'm, you know, they were tough taskmasters, but I'm very grateful to them. There are people in our community who still talk about your mom in the upholstery classes. <clears throat> she was teaching upholstery adult education upholstery into her 92nd year. <laughs> and students would come, adult, these are adults, would come semester after semester, sometimes bringing the same item back to be reupholstered. <laughs> <clears throat> because she, she kind of ran a um, psychology class. <laughs> I mean, she just, they loved just her, her homespun, uh, philosophy on life, and uh, so she has, um, she had lots of followers, and uh, we, when she finally retired at, at the end of 90, uh, when she turned 92, um, we gave her a uh, kind of uh, retirement party, and she just turned 93, and it was uh, right at the beginning of Lent, so we had a Mardi Gras party. 
and she died three weeks later. And you took a pin cushion, oh. <laughs> which is a beautiful story to honor her. So uh, you know, her Armenian heritage was very much about her person. Um, and you know, those who have lost loved ones, whether it's the Holocaust or the Armenian Genocide or the Rwanda Genocide or what's going on today and um, the uh, Rohingyans, I, I mean, you know, it's happening all around us and oftentimes we just turn our heads away. But it, it truly imprints um, the following generation and the following generation. And she um, was very um, troubled by all of that. And uh, so she always wanted us to kind of talk about our Armenian um, heritage. But as a kid growing up, there was no Armenia. So you always had to explain that, well, you're ha I was half German and half Armenia and, and that the country doesn't live anymore, it, it doesn't exist. So it was one of those kinds of experiences. So it took me a long time to really uh, appreciate that heritage. Uh, so on the 100th uh, anniversary of the genocide in uh, Armenia, I was part of a delegation, along with our, my colleague and great friend, Anna Eshu. We are the two Armenian Americans in Congress, and I refer to us as being in the epicenter of the Armenian <laughs> diaspora because um, we're the only two. Uh, we were part of a presidential delegation to go to Yerevan for <clears throat> the um, remembrance. The Congress of the United States has yet to recognize the Armenian Genocide, which is, excuse me, <clears throat> um, deeply um, troubling to me. Uh, but the Pope actually, Pope Francis actually recognized at the event. So there's this uh, beautiful eternal flame and there were um, flowers that were left all around it. So um, mom was always busy with her hands. I mean, always sewing, always, so she would take tuna cans empty tuna cans, fill them with Dacron, um, put a cardboard uh, border around it, somehow put it together, sew it into a pin cushion so it looked like a little bonnet. And there's a picture of it in here. Um, and so I took, and after she passed away, there were like 20 of them sitting around the house. <laughs> I took one of them and the program from her funeral um, to uh, the memorial and left it at the eternal flame since she was never able to go back to Armenia. Beautiful. So you've had to deal with, um, how should I put this tactfully, some very unintelligent men in your career. And there, there are several, sorry guys, there are several quotes in the book of when you lost, when you had the miscarriages, when you faced off against someone at the state capitol regarding assault rifles. When, I mean, it is a constant theme and you always come back with integrity and even compassion for their idiot questions. Um, but you have addressed it. So can you share some of those? I mean, some of those stories are, I, I just don't know how you didn't turn off and slug somebody. <clears throat> well, I'll tell two stories. Um, one was uh, in the state assembly and it was a uh, assault weapon ban that then Senate leader uh, Dave Roberti was authoring on the Senate side and he asked me to jockey it on the House floor. So I'm presenting the bill on the House floor and uh, as Kevin knows, uh, you know, you, you throw up your microphone and, and you are um, being recognized. So um, I'm in the middle of my speech. One of my colleagues, his name was Larry Bowler, uh, flips his microphone up and he's recognized and um, he says, Ms. Spear, I have a question. I said, okay. Ms. Spear, have you ever shot an assault weapon? And he says it again. Have you ever shot an assault weapon? And I thought to myself, if this guy is stupid enough to ask me this question, I'm going to give it right back. So I said, 
No, Assemblyman, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever been shot by an assault weapon? <laughs> <laughs> and the assembly floor went quiet. He sits down. His colleague behind him says, good job, Ted, a reference to um, the Mary Tyler Moore show that had the Ted Baxter on it. <laughs> And, and to show you how different it was back then than it is today, that bill flew off the assembly floor and was signed into law by Republican Pete Wilson. Uh, a more recent one in, in the House happened when um, my colleague from New Jersey was sitting, was standing on the House floor. It was late at night. Uh, we were debating H.R. 1. Uh, the Republicans had just taken over the House, and this was the first bill they introduced, and it was a bill to uh, defund Planned Parenthood. The number one bill, the most important issue to defund Planned Parenthood. Um, and he's standing on the floor, and he's reading from a book written by someone um, about um, second trimester abortions. And I'm sitting there, and I was, it was my turn next to speak, and I was actually going to speak about um, the, the lack of logic in the fact that they wanted to defund Planned Parenthood because a receptionist misspoke when someone had tried to run a sting through um, at a, a particular Planned Parenthood facility and she, she just misspoke. Meanwhile, Halliburton, that had a $2.3 billion contract with the federal government, had um, bribed a foreign country, which is illegal, and yet we were still funding Halliburton. So that was what I was going to speak about. <clears throat> but after he started speaking and reading from this book, I thought, oh my God, how can you possibly He's saying these things. So when I, it was my turn to speak, I just ripped into him. And I say, how dare you speak about something you know nothing about? Because I did have a second term abortion when I lost um, uh, my second miscarriage. It's a horrific experience to go through. And it, it kind of, you know, was, was shocking for those that were on the floor. <clears throat> and John Lewis um, was there. And as I finished, I was, I was trembling, I was so upset. And um, he came up to me and he said, Jackie, that's one of the most powerful speeches I've ever heard on this floor. And then he told me this story that has stayed with me. He said, when I was young, my aunt was staying with us. And one day, she came down the stairs with my mother in a blood-stained nightgown and never came back. But she had probably had a <clears throat> Mali abortion. So it's really important for us to appreciate that there's a reason why our country has embraced many of the policies we have embraced over centuries. And for us now to focus on women as almost chattel, that somehow we're not smart enough to make decisions in conjunction with our, our um, physicians, or that, that somehow government has a role in that is, is deeply troubling to me. Disturbing. How about the Affordable Care <clears throat> Act? Yeah. How, to, how about it? That, is there a chance? Is there a chance to uh, the current? The, the president said now he's waiting till the next term to, to bring it up. But is there a way to keep it keep it alive for the thousands and thousands of people who didn't have health care until it came into being? So the Affordable Care Act is here um, to stay. There is no no question in my mind. You know, it, it's, it's kind of ironic. So it passes 
um, you know, we had vicious town halls. I remember being at a town hall in San Carlos and it was so hot and we had uh, police escorts because there were so many people, I mean, people were being bussed in from who knows where. And they all, a lot of them had signs like, yeah, don't take my Medicare waiver, keep your hands off my Medicare, which of course is a federal program, but uh, so we, it gets passed, it, it starts to go into effect, and you know, there's a recognition that, my goodness, this is, this, this is valuable, this is important. People are all benefiting from it. Everyone benefits from it, from people uh, who are senior citizens and on Medicare to those who are uh, employed and have health insurance because we expanded what was, had to be covered. So all the, got, all the businesses had to uh, meet that standard, which meant that for lots of services, you don't have a copay. For all the preventative health care, you have no copay. So even after it's taking effect 65 times, 65 times, my colleagues on the other side um, passed bills to repeal it in the House. Didn't succeed. Um, and then the House flipped last year because people recognized that health care is a right in this country and we have got to stand for it. We are the only industrialized country of 11 in the world that don't provide universal coverage for health care. So um, the problem we have now that we have to fix is that we no longer have an individual mandate. And when you don't have an individual mandate and you're going to cover pre-existing conditions, uh, the premiums are going to go up. And so we've got to find a way to restore that individual mandate so that the, um, the cost can be kept down. And then there's lots of other things we need to do to the law to make it more cost effective. I mean, there's, and transparency is one of them, creating transparency um, in terms of medical costs and, uh, you know, the, um, the various drugs. And one of the things I want to get rid of, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, there is no reason why we have to listen and watch all of these ads on TV around pharmaceutical drugs. It's money that should be spent. Yeah. It's money that should be spent on R&D. We don't, because for the physicians, they then have to explain why they're not giving this particular drug to the patient, and the patient's not happy with that, so, you know, a after 20 minutes of trying to explain it, they write out the script for this drug. So, um, it's, again, the physician, the phys physician is in the best position to help that patient make that decision, not the um, PR firms. So. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. So you talk about, you serve on very powerful House committees, one of them being the arms, armed services. And there is the constant discussion on sexual assault in the military. And you have addressed that head on. Could you share some of the experiences? Because the hearings have been very powerful. So I got into this issue, uh, shortly after I got elected to Congress, I was sitting in a committee hearing and there was a, a, a discussion about this and some of the members of the military said things like, well, one of the issue, uh, issues is the use of alcohol, the other is you know, provocative attire. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Uh, and then as I started to research it, I realized we had a huge problem. There are 15,000 sexual assaults in the military every single year. Most of them happening to men, I might add, because there are so many more men than there are women. Although that number is starting to change, um, about 20% of the military now is female. And at the military academies, it's approaching 30%. So we have to fix it. 15,000 sexual assaults a year, 5,000 report, only 5,000 report. And the reason they don't report is because there is this fear of retaliation, because that happens over and over again. And of the 5,000 that report, 
only 500 of them go to court-martial. And of the 500 that go to court-martial, only 250 are convicted. So you look at those numbers, you can see why people don't report. It has an impact on cohesion. It scars these service members often for life. And part of the problem is we have what's called um, the chain of command and you're required to report up the chain of command and it's the chain of command that makes the decision whether or not to prosecute. And oftentimes, as we found out when uh, Senator McSally divulged just a few weeks ago, the perpetrator is in the chain of command. And if it's not the perpetrator, it's the friend of the perpetrator. Or you don't want this particular rape case to be uh, court ending in a court martial because it will reflect poorly on you in terms of good order and discipline within your, um, your um, company or your brigade. And so you don't have it investigated or you don't have it go to court martial. So there's a huge conflict of interest. So I've been fighting this battle now for, what, eight years. Um, and we've made some inroads, but we still haven't gotten it out of the chain of command. Um, and the stories are just um, reprehensible because, you know, the brass takes care of the brass. There's this uh, phrase in the military, different spanks for different ranks. Ooh. And it's true. So part of my job is to hold them accountable and um, it's, it's tough. Now, the biggest problem right now is that in our military academies, 50% of the cadets say they're sexually harassed. This is the best and the brightest. I appoint these young, talented people to the academy where they get a $400,000 scholarship for four years and they become our officers. And if 50% of them are sexually harassing, or 50% of those in the military are sexually harassed, and uh, there's a 20% sexual assault race, we got a huge problem. So we're trying to fix it. The other committee you serve on, intelligence, um, with, with all the current goings on, you have just been um, constantly on CNN and NPR. How, do, how does that work? Do they call you? Yeah, no, I don't call them. <laughs> I mean, I mean but, but are, they, are they in the house and... and so what typically happens is uh, they call my communications person and, and see if I'll come on. And uh, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. There's one person who calls all the time that I will never go on his show. And it's Lawrence O'Donnell. <laughs> hmm. um, because the first five times he asked me to come on his show and we would rearrange the schedule, he then canceled. So I thought, all right, you're done. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> uh, so that's how it happens. And, you know, it's, uh, I really feel it's my obligation to just speak truth to power. And um, I don't sugarcoat it. I just say what's on my mind. And I think the American people want to hear unfiltered commentary about what's going on. And so I feel compelled to do it. So there's a section in the book, I'm gonna bring it back to family, because your brother came to see you in mm -hmm. the hospital after Jonestown, and he did something mm -hmm. for you. And talk about compassion, and it, it, you have a very close relationship with Eric. With your, your well, I, I will, right now it's, it's not as close as, as but he's a Trump supporter, so we have. <laughs> oh. Okay. That didn't pick up on. So <laughs> we'll, we'll go back to the compassion. I moment. love him dearly, but <laughs> it's very hard for us to have a conversation. And he sends me this nonsense constantly that I have done. Anyway, so, um, so after I was airlifted out of uh, uh, Georgetown, Guyana, um, and I just want to tell this particular part of the story because it. Um, it just stays with me. So we finally get airlifted from the airstrip in Guyana to uh, 
Georgetown, the capital. And I'm being taken on this um, gurney or cot, whatever it was, um, onto this US medevac plane that had arrived. And I'm looking up at this shiny white plane with the words United States of America. And I felt like someone had just wrapped me in the American flag. And there's never a time that I say the Pledge of Allegiance or sing the national anthem that I don't take myself back that moment. Because we are so lucky to live in this country. And um, it's a great reminder to me that it is um, a very special place and that we need to protect it. But in any case, I, so I'm airlifted out. I'm, I'm taken to um, Andrews Air Force Base. They do, you know, some, some um, I go into the oper operating room. I don't know what they did. They probably debrided me because I was just full of, um, you know, particular matter and everything. And um, then they shipped me off to the Baltimore shock trauma because I had gas gangrene. They were afraid they were gonna have to amputate my leg and my arm. Um, so it's, you know, in this ICU kind of setting that is very intense and there's bright lights everywhere and they finally moved me into this side area and my brother shows up. And um, it was, you know, obviously so special to have family there. Um, and because it was such a uh, urgent situation, I, I, you know, they were just dealing with trying to keep me alive. I still had all this mud and dirt from the Guyanese um, uh, tarmac, tarmac uh, um, in my hair. So my brother uh, washed my hair and got all of that out. That was very special. Um, Congresswoman Jackie, would you consider taking of a few course, questions from the audience? So audience questions. Now, there is so much, I am really, going to encourage every single person in this room, pick up your copy, read it. It is resilience, it is family, it is faith, it is friends. It's, it's incredible. And we wanted, Carol and I really talked about this conversation and we wanted all of you to learn things that you didn't know that and that it's not all politics and that it is about family friends faith and so there we we just hope that you got some of that today because it was just incredibly beautiful thank you can i just tell one little um last story um so i i was a single mom for eight years uh, before i was introduced to barry and there's a very funny story in there about our first date and second date and third date and um, but it, so there's a lot of trauma in my life and then Barry comes into the picture and one of the, the greatest gifts um, that I have received from him was his interest in wanting to adopt both Jackson and Stephanie which he did um, which says so much about him, but also about um, how, um, you know, life does bring us a lot of um, uh, flowers that do bloom from time to time, even when we've been in the muck. Can we so get thank Barry? you, darling. <laughs> So Bridget Michelson from Penn TV has the microphone if, oh, and Maggie has one over there. So we have a question, I think, oh, Charles. Can you please identify yourself as well? Charles Stone. Hey. <laughs> I'm Charles Stone. Uh, thank you for sharing your story with us. One of the things that stood out in your book to me and stayed with me was the fact that when you were working in your earliest uh, political work, it's working. Is working on okay for uh, Leo Ryan's campaign. On the other side of the aisle, one of your best friends was working for his Republican opponent, and you noted that it never interfered with your friendship, especially given the climate in which we live today, with increasing tribalism and a failure to be able to kind of 
see past politics and see the person. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we get back to a day where we can move fast that? And it seems to be something that's quintessentially San Mateo County where we don't do that. And I just wish the rest of the country could see that and do it as well. You know, it, it starts at the top, and by that I mean whether it's the top of um, the executive branch or the top of the legislative branch. So you can basically point fingers at all of those who are at the top. Um, there is not a, an interest necessarily in um, coming together unless or until we have to, which is a great um, criticism. And it's because we've created such a, uh, a cynicism and a, uh, a, a belief that somehow compromise is a dirty word. You know, we're, we're being taken to the extremes on both ends, right? You're not progressive enough, you're not conservative enough. And so the result is that um, it, it, there's this big schism that exists that is hard to, to bring together. Now, there are some good news stories. I mean, we, we do come together on um, issues from time to time. And, you know, the Me Too Congress Act that I got passed, um, I got passed in large part because my, my wingman, so to speak, was a very conservative Republican from Alabama. And he's, his name's Bradley Byrne. Uh, I, I think the world of him. And he was able to convince his Republican colleagues because he's an employment law lawyer and he knows um, what in the private sector, um, the liability that exists if you don't um, provide the kinds of benefits and the like. So, there are examples. Here's, but here's the problem, VAWA. We just passed it, VAWA is the Violence Against Women Act. We just passed it in the House. Um, it's been expired now. It's expired last September. It's always been a bipartisan measure. It's never been problematic. It's been renewed three different times since 1994. Um, it, it, it's really important for us to, um, you know, make sure that we have the resources in our communities for those that are victims of domestic violence. So we added a provision that um, would prevent persons who have been convicted of stalking, uh, who have committed domestic violence and those kinds of acts from being able to have a gun now, if you're a, you know, in, in a formerly in an intimate relationship and now you are not, uh, often that creates rage. And if someone has a gun in that setting, you can see what happens. Most women who are killed, who are murdered, are, mil are murdered by intimate partners. So here's this provision in the bill, and the NRA doesn't like it. And so many of my colleagues won't support it. Now, it gets out of the House. I don't know what's going to happen in the Senate, but it, you know, it's this, this politics that is now requiring you to just follow this litmus test that doesn't allow members to, um, to have the courage to come to the middle. And we've got to come to the middle more. Congresswoman Spear, I'm, I'm Gautam Dada. And I salute your commitment to family. And recently, as we all heard, a lot of I mean, refugee kids were separated from their parents. And I wanted to commend your work on their behalf. And if you could give us an update on those efforts, that would, I think, really help us. So I led a delegation of 25 members to, the, um, to McAllen, Texas last June. Um, and what we saw there was, was reprehensible. Now, because of the efforts of uh, many people um, after that particular visit and a couple of more, the zero policy um, 
procedure that the administration had undertaken was, was ceased. But let me let me tell you how how dangerous this is. I mean, what we saw was um, was criminal. Children, they call it the ice box. So when you're first apprehended at Border Patrol, you are um, you're in like a what looks like a county jail with these these little cells and they're, it's very cold. So there was one cell with boys and all these um, mylar blankets. And then there was one with girls. There was one with mothers and some children. And as I walk through there, you know, there's a, a window so you can see in. There's this little girl standing at the door, sobbing. And I go up to one of the Border Patrol officers, this, this child is sobbing, would you find out what's wrong with her? And why is she sobbing? She says, well, we had to separate her because we don't know if the woman she came in with was her mother. So they talked to her and then they opened the door where the mothers and the children are and this child goes running to her mother's arms. Then we went and visited um, an ICE facility where they were all mothers, and all their children had been taken away from them. And they were in what looked like prison garb. And they didn't know where their kids were. Some had been there for three weeks. I mean, it was horrific. Now, we're not doing that sensibly anymore. But as the American Pediatric Association and the president of that association said to us, it does irreparable harm. It affects the structure of the brain. So this will be not just a black eye, but a sin on our country that we did this at all. And those who come to this country to seek asylum are following the law. It was ratified by our Senate. It's a treaty that we have embraced that was originally um, crafted in the UN. Someone who comes to the United States and approaches a law enforcement officer seeking asylum must be allowed in. There needs to be a credible fear review immediately and then subsequently an actual hearing before an immigration judge as to whether or not they meet the asylum standards. Now most people don't receive asylum Historically, only about 30% actually receive asylum. Uh, but what's going on in the Northern Triangle, something that we have no concept of. I mean, we, we have no idea how they extort money from you, and if you don't give them money, they kill you. And many of these families are coming here be, out of fear. And think about it if you were in their shoes. And you had children, what would you do? I know what I would do. I'd do everything in my power to save my child. So um, we've got to open our hearts again. Uh, Diana Reddy, City of Redwood City. Um, thank you. Ah, thank you so much for being with us <laughs> this morning. Uh, that last one was a little bit um, too much for me. Um, the courage that you demonstrated in Guyana was only the beginning, in my view, of the courage you've demonstrated. And thank you so much for all that you do and in representing us um, here in California. Um, I've always wondered, what was the time uh, frame between the time that you were behind the wheel, wondering you know, what your next move would be, and that you were rescued? Uh, I, I was on that airstrip for 22 hours. It's amazing. So I was, uh, this is kind of a funny story, so I'm. <laughs> That's the funny part. <laughs> Perhaps to you, I'm no, not well, sure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on Dr. Phil. No, no, excuse me, I was on, I get these doctors confused. I was on Dr. Oz. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because he's a doctor, he has to, you know, make it have a medical element to it. And 
so we're talking about um, my injuries and how you know my whole leg was blown up, and uh, the, but the femoral artery was untouched, and it doesn't make a lot of sense because everything around it was blown up, and if the femoral artery had been severed, I would have bled to death in 90 seconds. So he puts the um, on the screen you know, a, a, a um, diagram of the human body and where the femoral artery is. <laughs> and then he turns to me and he says, you know, it's a miracle that you're alive. And I guess coming from him, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, it was a miracle. It was a miracle that I survived. And uh, I've never forgotten that. And that's why I, I don't ever take it for granted. But, you know, there's a plan for each of us, and I talk about this in the book. There really is a plan for each of us. Sometimes we don't know what it is when it's happening, but once we have hindsight, we can say, oh, now I understand why. So, got to believe in that plan. Good morning, Judy Taylor. Um, you have personal experience that most of us hope and pray we never have, uh, both in terms of gun violence, in terms of reproductive rights. Uh, not Jackie Spear, the congressperson, but Jackie Spear, the individual. How do you deal with people who come into your life who are completely ignorant, but yet believe they know way more than you about these things? I'll talk to, no. <laughs> um, it's very important to listen. You know, what I have found in, in people, particularly on, on Capitol Hill, where we're just like miles apart, oftentimes we stereotype people and we pigeonhole them, um, but they have a life experience too that brought them to where they are. And sometimes it's really important to just listen respectfully to what they have to say. I mean, you, you'll end up disagreeing, but you might find out something about them. There's redeeming qualities in everybody. Well, mostly everybody. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I try to do. You know, there's, I, I'm, I'm very religious, but I don't wear it on my sleeve. And yet there's this um, Thursday morning Bible um, group that meets, and you know, they will study the Bible and, um, and have people come and speak to them. And they, there's, a, there's a sense of camaraderie and spirit that, that occurs there. But unfortunately, when they leave, you know, it's a different world. It's sort of like they, you know, they walk out from one very thoughtful and forgiving environment into another where, you know, you're in the middle of a arena and you're you know, fighting it out. So, um, but nonetheless, I, I, still, I still try to look for the redeeming qualities in people. <laughs> uh, Congressman, I would love to get your thoughts on the Miller Report and the Miller Report and where we go from here. So the Mueller Report belongs to the American people your tax dollars that paid for it, and you have every right to see every last word of it. The extent to which um, they can make effective arguments that grand jury testimony shouldn't be made public, I mean, I'd, I'd consider looking at that. Or anything that was classified. There shouldn't be virtually anything that's classified. Um, unless you're going into sources and methods, but I can't imagine that, that there's gonna be any of that in it. So, uh, it will become public one way or the other. Um, I am not confident that what we will see will be unabridged. And I think what we've already recognized and witnessed is that some of those who worked on the Mueller report who, by the way, never leaked. You never saw leaks coming out of the Mueller team. Now they're starting to leak in part because of how it's being played out. We're not stupid. 
the American people aren't stupid. And there appears to be an orchestrated effort here to present a particular point of view for a particular reason. Uh, the Attorney General wrote a unsolicited 19-page letter to the President of the United States, which was his application for this job. And in that 19 pages, he basically said that the Mueller investigation was illegitimate and that any case made about obstruction of justice um, would not be relevant because of the guidelines under the Attorney General's office about not charging a sitting president. So he, you know, he came and all of a sudden he becomes Attorney General. So he has a point of view. He has a bias that he's already reflected in his 19-page uh, letter of application. I think it's ironic that his summary of 400 pages was only four pages long. Um, so it's, it's yet again another example, I think, of what we're up against. There, there's no question in my mind that the Russian intervention in our election was real. 17 intelligence agencies said with high confidence that that happened. And yet we still have the president not able to say that. I mean, his, and, and you know, I, I serve on the Intelligence Committee and I have for four years, so let me explain how bad it was that he stood next to Vladimir Putin in Helsinki and when asked the question said, well, you know, Mr. Putin, President Putin doesn't, says he doesn't, that he didn't do it. The fact that the president still uses an unsecured cell phone is, uh, an, you know, I, I don't want to say an act of treason, but it is creating a national security risk. And the Chinese know that he has that unsecured phone, and they're good at this. And they probably know more about what the president's thinking than we do. And that should worry all of us. So, uh, the, the issue of obstruction of justice, in my personal view, is there in plain sight. And the fact that Special Counsel Mueller could not come to a conclusion on that is volumes, because he's looking at a criminal conduct standard. He's looking at beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not the standard that we should be looking at it. We should be looking at it as, is there a preponderance of the evidence that he obstructed justice? And do we want a president of the United States obstructing justice? Is that okay with us? So anyway, that's where I am on the Mueller report. <laughs> Hi, my name's Joanne Price. Uh, thank you for sharing your powerful story with us all this morning. Um, I'm with Life Moves, and Life Moves is the largest homeless shelter provider on the peninsula. We house 750 people each night, and 50% of those beds are with children. At the last point in time count in 2017, there was 9,500 people reported as homeless. I'm relatively new to homeless and I come from the private sector, and I just joined as their VP of real estate. And I'm learning, and I've spent the last nine months learning about best practice from around the country and also around the world. And I've been speaking to um, an organization in New York where they have 62,000 people homeless every night. Yet they have a policy in place which is a right to shelter, and I wanted to get your view on that. There's no question we should have a right to shelter. No question at all. And Life Moves is an extraordinary organization. I've um, always been very supportive of it. Um, and thank you for all you're doing. Uh, I think that 
you know, as I look back at my childhood and as you look back at your childhood, you hardly ever saw people on the streets. And now it's, it, it's commonplace. Now, separate and distinct from that is the fact that we have people living in homes in conditions that you wouldn't want people to have to live in. Families living in one room. I was um, meeting with many of the leaders in Daly City on Friday, and you know the, the housing situation in Daly City, the the intensive living conditions of, of many people in our county because it's so expensive to live there, and yet they have to work there. So um, I think the right to shelter should be part of every city council set of ordinances. And I hope that you'll consider that. I think as a final, what we'd love for you to share is a final piece of advice <laughs> with the audience. These are your people. I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it. And we are a strong county. We've talked a lot this weekend. We're all in it together. And we overcame a number of challenges to be able to be here today. Um, thank you, Amy Buckmaster and your team. Uh, well, thank you both for um, the opportunity to be here. I, it's, I can't tell you how great it is to be with all of you. I used to come every year when I was on the Board of Supervisors, and as time goes on and um, responsibilities have changed, I haven't been able to join you as often. So it's really been a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, what I would say is you know how good you are. You know how capable you are. Uh, we should have as our goal, from a regional standpoint in San Mateo County, um, a, a vision for what we want this county to look like at the end of the century. And we should deliver that to our kids. I mean, I think we're doing it on many levels. I mean, the sea level rise issue is huge, and now we're looking at creating an assessment district, and I'm very supportive of Dave Pine and uh, Carol and everyone else who's working on that uh, because I know that we're not getting the federal dollars we could be getting had we created what Santa Clara County has done. So I think the more we can regionally come together and work together, the airport noise issue is horrific. We need to come up with some solutions. I'm going to try and beat the FAA up on a federal level with some bills I'm going to introduce in a few weeks. But, um, but I, would, I think the more we can convene efforts together and work together, because the truth of the matter is we are 20 different cities and a county, whereas San Francisco is a city and county, and that fact makes them much more attractive for all kinds of dollars. And if we could work together more, and certainly the Progress Seminar gives us an opportunity to, to think beyond just um, crossing T's and dotting I's, um, but it would sure be pretty phenomenal if we came up with a vision for the, the county for the next uh, 30 years and, uh, or 40 years, and um, actually delivered on it because um, because we really are good people. And we have a, an interest in working together. So as parochial as we can be with our various um, cities, um, we're stronger together. So the more we can create opportunities um, to be regionally a power. Congresswoman, uh, we, um, we think that we have the best representation in Washington, D.C. And we just can't thank you enough for being here today and sharing all that thank with us. You. Can I just end with one quote? Thank you. Sit down. Let me, 
Let me just leave you with uh, my favorite quotation, which is anonymous. Life should not be a journey uh, to the end with the intention of arriving in a well-preserved body, <laughs> but rather to be totally used up, totally worn out, chocolate in one hand, martini in the other, <laughs> screaming, woohoo, what a ride. <laughs>